was just speaking about the construction of the earliest version of the banjo, uh, the gourd banjo, and saying that uh, it was indeed constructed from a gourd with a uh, stick or plank inserted through it, and uh, anywhere from three to four strings. The fifth string was probably not added until uh, actually the early 19th century. So the first banjos would have had either two long strings and one short string, or three long strings and one short string. But again, that that short uh, string on the top of the instrument, sometimes referred to as a drone string, is really critical when you're considering the history of the banjo. It's really what differentiates the banjo from all other instruments, uh, guitars, mandolins, uh, it's really that fifth string that makes a banjo a banjo. So I'm, I'm going to play a tune here that is one of the earliest tunes that we can connect to African or African American uh, styles of the banjo. This is a tune called Pompey Ran Away, um, almost certainly referring to a runaway slave, Pompey being a, a classical name. Um, often given to slaves, Caesar, Pompey, uh, Nero, all common names. This comes from a 1782 book published in Glasgow called A Selection of Scottish, Irish, English, and Foreign Airs, uh, published by a Joe Aird of, uh, of uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, so this was described as a Negro jig. It's a little bit stylized, but to my ears, it, it definitely has um, a certain West African sound to it. I'll, I'll leave it to you uh, to decide what you think. So here it is, Pompey Ran Away. Sort of uh, short repeating motifs there um, uh, again sound very West African to my ear at least and uh, I, I would suggest um, just based on my experience in West African music that there might have been multiple banjo players playing this each taking one of those sections uh, and playing it at the same time so that the melodies sort of interweave uh, again a very common uh, uh, motif in in West African music um, so again, the, the first players of the banjo in America would definitely have been uh, African and African-American slaves, but um, as might be imagined with an instrument as awesome as the banjo, um, uh, southern uh, white musicians also uh, started becoming interested in the banjo probably in the early 1800s. Again, uh, evidence is pretty scarce for that time period. But we do know that there was the, this great rise of white players of the banjo in the 1930s and 1940s, particularly um, the great minstrel players Dan Emmett and Joel Walker Sweeney from right here in Virginia. So I'm going to switch over now to what was known as a tackhead banjo, and that was sort of the first um, commercial banjo and also the first banjos made of um, machined components. With the original gourd banjos, they could be made um, with really minimal amounts of metal, just really tacks to hold down the um, to hold the skin resonating board in place. Um, with the tackhead banjo, the body of the banjo is actually made from a wooden hoop, in this case uh, a uh, grain sifter. I should mention as well that uh, the gourd banjo that I'm playing here, uh, you can see it online at WTJU.net. Um, and this was made by Pete Ross of Baltimore, Maryland, who makes uh, a lot of fine reproductions of all the various uh, banjo instruments that we have uh, uh, pictorial representations of from the 1800s and 1700s. He's also curator of the wonderful Boucher exhibit happening right now at the Museum of Industry in Baltimore. <laughs> 
so the banjo w um, became wildly popular for the first time in its existence throughout America, um, and to a certain extent was the most uh, popular sort of pop instrument in America in the um, 1840s, thanks to the popularizing uh, of the instrument by Dan Emmett, Joel Walker Sweeney, and all of the other various minstrel troops. Um, this happened in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, uh, Joel Walker Sweeney was in uh, New, uh, New York City in, 19, in 1839. In 1840, he goes to Boston. Uh, in the next couple of years, he makes an international tour in England and in Europe, comes back to great uh, popular acclaim in the north, and finally comes back south in 1846. Uh, in the 1850s, we start seeing banjo manuals, and these are our earliest uh, musical records of what was happening, aside from the sheet music that was being done of the various minstrel tunes of Emmett and Sweeney, um, which it's hard to say those, much of that music was arranged for pianoforte or viola or violin or German flute, fife. Uh, it wasn't so much banjo music. But then in the 1850s, we start getting these banjo manuals. So these tunes that I'm going to play for you are from an, an 1858 manual by Phil Rice, uh, Phil, My uh, Phil Rice's banjo uh, manual, uh, and his was sort of, um, I guess, the third popular banjo manual to ca uh, come out. There was over half of a dozen uh, that came out within a 20-year period, starting in uh, 1850 or so. So I'm going to play you a couple of tunes, uh, John Diamond, Walk Around, uh, and then The Power of Music, and finish up with The Old Gander. <laughs> 
want to send those tunes out to uh, Joe Harris down there in Tuckahoe, my uh, teacher for minstrel style uh, banjo style banjo, and uh, the man who's republished many of these early banjo instructional manuals, giving us a valuable insight into the earliest type of banjo. Again, this is really the earliest musical record that we have of, of the banjo of any sort. Um, it's an open question how much of this music um, was European influenced um, or perhaps taken entirely from European sources. There's some jigs and reels there that are obviously taken from Scottish or Irish or English sources. Um, Mrs. McLeod's uh, reel, for example, common uh, Irish tune. Uh, however, there are also some obvious uh, tunes of American extraction. Um, John Diamond Walkaround, for example, ret refers to a, uh, a famous uh, dancer of the time. And it's also an open question how much of this music was derived from African or African-American sources. Um, nobody was being credited uh, for their songs, at least nobody who didn't have a banjo manual to their name. Um, so again, it's kind of hard to to say, but this is certainly the earliest music that we can hear that was meant for and played upon the banjo. So uh, this this music of uh, the minstrel uh, era was wildly popular both in the north and the south. There were you know, roving minstrel troops that went um, all over um, America at that point and also uh, throughout Europe, particularly uh, in England. The, but at the same time, there was a folk tradition that was happening sort of, not underground, but it was a tradition that was not very well recorded. Um, the banjo uh, was continued to be played by black and white uh, Americans in a sort of more uh, folk style, less influenced by these banjo manuals. Um, in certain cases, people may have learned from the banjo manuals, gone out into the mountains or the countryside, and, and the cities too, of course. Um, and there the banjo evolved into uh, something new and wonderful, particularly in the South. So uh, in this next portion of the show, I, I'd like to play some tunes on a, a steel-strung banjo, uh, a banjo made in the late uh, 19th century. So this is a banjo from probably the late 1880s or else the early 1890s. It's called a, a Fairbanks electric banjo, um, electric being the name of the that specific model of banjo. It wasn't actually electrified. Um, it comes from Boston, Massachusetts, made by A.C. Fairbanks and Sons, who were uh, in the sort of top uh, top rung of technical banjo makers. Uh, this banjo has a lot of metal to it. Um, the uh, sort of circular body of the banjo, the pot of the banjo, is covered on uh, one side with metal. It has a, a metal tone ring. It has a metal stretcher. It has um, mechanical tuners, all sorts of different stuff. Another big difference is that sometime in the mid-19th century, um, or mid to late 19th century frets were introduced uh, into the banjo, those sort of uh, horizontal uh, metal bars that allow a lot more speed and a certain degree more of accuracy on the banjo. Up until that point, um, all banjos and banjo-like instruments uh, were fretless, just like a, a fiddle, or a violin, um, viola, cello, bass. So that was a, a major change in the banjo. The introduction of uh, all of the metal to the banjo also increased its volume somewhat and gave it a lot more stability. Um, also, uh, I, the banjo that I'm playing probably would have been strung with gut strings originally, but I've put metal strings on, um, which again is sort of a later sound. So I'd, I'd like to play you some tunes now that come from throughout the rural south, uh, a lot from here in Virginia, but also into North Carolina and Kentucky as well, and maybe Tennessee if we come to it. Um, this is music that was recorded um, in some cases as far back as the 1920s, uh, 30s, all the way up into the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, um, when these musicians who had been young men at the turn of the century were yeah, getting older. And what I'd really like um, for you to take away from this is just the um, the range and versatility of the banjo. Um, it's an instrument that these days is often identified only with um, bluegrass music, um, which is one branch of the banjo, but by no means the totality of it. Um, this is 
a, a music that at certain times in its life has been um, played by black and white Americans of every different class, um, from you know the poorest uh, Appalachian farmer to uh, the University of Virginia banjo, mandolin, and glee club of uh, 1895. We've actually got a picture right here in the studio of a bunch of extremely well dressed uh, upper classmen, uh, upper craftsmen, classmen. <laughs> in their uh, tuxedos, carrying their extremely uh, fancy and expensive banjos, mandolins. Um, quite a picture. We'll talk a little bit more about that history in a moment, but I want to play a couple of tunes for you first. <laughs> ¶¶ 